I'm Maya Nicholson, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for January 27th, 2024. Earlier this week, President Joe Biden released his second report in accordance with the War Powers Resolution, notifying Congress of the second round of joint U.S.-U.K. strikes against the Houthis in Yemen. For today's Archive episode, I picked an episode from March 12, 2021, in which Benjamin Witte sat down with John Bellinger, Scott Anderson, and Rebecca Ingber to talk about how the Biden administration justified its strikes in Syria at the time, the reports it had not yet given on its legal and policy framework for counterterrorism, AUMF reform, and more. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 12, 2021. Joe Biden conducted military strikes in Syria. He's also reined in temporarily the use of drone strikes, and he has articulated legal theories under which the Syria strikes were proper. It's a good opportunity to have a conversation about Biden and war powers, and we have just the group to do it. John Bellinger was the legal advisor at the State Department and the legal advisor for the National Security Council in the Bush administration. Lawfare senior editor Scott Anderson worked in the State Department legal advisor's office as well as in the Iraqi embassy. And Rebecca Ingber also worked at State Legal and is currently a professor at Cardoza Law School. We talked about how the Biden administration justified the strikes in Syria. We talked about the reports it has not yet given on its legal and policy framework for counterterrorism. We talked about whether this is the year that AUMF reform might finally happen and which authorizations to use military force might finally see reform. It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 12th. War Powers, and the Biden administration. So, for those who have been focused on Joe Biden's dog, Mr. Potato Head, the Royals, and Dr. Seuss, Scott, bring us up to speed on why we are having a War Powers conversation this week what happened and what is the the conversation that it provokes yeah absolutely you know over the last 2 weeks we've seen a number of small events that give kind of windows into how the biden administration might be or seems to be thinking about certain fundamental questions about war powers meaning both the president's constitutional and statutory authority to use force and related international law questions kind of bundling all those together under that umbrella. We, of course, had airstrikes in Syria against uh, Qatab Hezbollah and another associated Shia-backed militia, uh, which were uh, blamed uh, or or given responsibility for a series of attacks on U.S. and Iraqi forces in different locations in Iraq, including an attack in Erbil that killed a U.S. contractor. Um, And then we saw a subsequent response subsequent to that airstrike uh, of another rocket attack in which another U.S. contractor died of of a heart attack, apparently. We also saw the administration issue an interim national security strategy, um, which kind of lays out a vision of its foreign policy and gives some hints at certain war powers questions. There were reports uh, in the media that the Biden administration, upon assuming office, reinstated certain restrictions on the use of military force outside of designated theaters of combat, commonly associated with the PPG guidance. That was the three-letter acronym given to the set of rules that govern those activities during the Obama administration, subsequently changed by the Trump administration, and then now maybe reinstated or moved back in a PPG direction while the process is undergoing review, a much more strict, restrictive sort of uh, approach to those issues. And then we saw a, another report due on March 1st, which is the legal and policy framework for the use of military force. Um, that is the report that you and I, along with uh, our friends at Protect Democracy and Democracy Forward, sued over last year to get and finally successfully got out of the Trump administration. It appears to have been provided to Congress on March 3rd, but uh, a week later, we actually haven't seen the public version yet. I've you know been asked Asking about this and have a little bit of sense of why uh, we can get into, but uh, it certainly provides another moment of reflection on these questions about how the Biden administration is thinking about some of the more fundamental questions of U.S. national security policy and foreign policy. All right. So let's talk about that legal framework that 
this describes. Rebecca, start us off. What do we know about the legal basis for the strikes in Syria? And to what extent do they sound any different from the legal basis that the Trump administration would have asserted for similar strikes in Syria? So there are different legal issues going on on here under both the international law and the domestic law framework. And a lot of this is pretty familiar, but there's one perhaps critical distinction between the way the Trump and Biden administrations have approached this. So first of all, as a matter of international law, which is in some ways the more complex question, the US government is claiming that it's acting in self-defense. That's gonna be that's gonna be sort of the typical justification for these kinds of strikes, but it's worth unpacking what that means here because Under the UN Charter, states can use force in another state's territory if they're acting in self-defense against an armed attack, and using that force is necessary and proportionate to repelling that attack. And that is how the United States is seeking to justify this use of force in Syria, that it's falling within that exception. But of course, Syria didn't strike us. We're not claiming that Syria was involved in these attacks. And so here, the US government's view is that it can respond to an attack by a non-state actor even in a state that didn't strike us, if it's necessary to do so. And when is it necessary to do so? Well, the US government's argument, which is pretty controversial, is that it's necessary to do so if the state is unwilling or unable to address that threat. So under this reasoning, the argument here would be that it was necessary to strike this particular facility to stop either to stop an ongoing attack or to prevent an imminent one. And this is where people have raised questions about this. And we can we can get into the weeds on this if you're interested. But people have raised questions about whether or not it was truly necessary to respond to use force against this particular facility in Syria. We were, of course, struck in Iraq. It's not even clear that we're necessarily responding with force to a facility used by precisely the same group. U.S. statements have been kind of vague on this. Was it going to be effective to strike this facility? Was this facility actually a launching base for strikes against U.S. forces, or was it merely a facility that happened to also be used by certain groups? And of course, there's now been another attack, and that attack is sort of a Rorschach test for people's views on whether or not our strike was legal and whether or not it was necessary if it wasn't actually sufficient to to stop future attacks. Okay, so that's the international law basis. And that's going to be a fairly similar basis that we've seen in past administrations. On the domestic side, this is where things get a little interesting. The Biden administration is claiming this authority based on constitutional power alone. Not interesting, but rather different than the last administration. So they are making an affirmative choice not to try to rely on somehow squeezing this these acts into prior congressional authorizations, in particular the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs, which the last administration suggested it was relying upon. And so presumably they are basing this theory now on the longstanding OLC theory that the president can use force as long as it's below a a certain threshold, as long as it's first in the national interest, which is a fairly low bar at this point when the president's claiming self-defense, and then second, not war in the constitutional sense. And it needs to be not war in the constitutional sense because, of course, the Constitution gives Congress, not the president, the power to declare war. So that's the legal theory. Okay. So, John, listening to Beck just now, I am struck by the fact that this conversation sounds an awful lot like ones that you and I were having 10 years ago. And I guess my question to you is, is this a more, the more things change, the more they stay the same thing? Or is there really, you know, is any of this movement in the legal theory actually significant? So I don't think there's much new in the legal theory. In fact, I think what's new here is that there isn't anything new, that it's being stated, in fact, in the Biden administration's inaugural war powers report. And so I want to say two things about that. One, this war powers report that reported on the strike in Syria, the report uh, was issued on February 27th, actually gives the international law basis for the strike, which is not required under the war powers resolution. War powers resolution only requires the president to provide the legislative or statutory basis, 
Uh, so the administration has gone farther to provide the international law basis, which I think is a good thing. I think it's actually always important. And in fact, we don't tell Congress enough uh, that the executive branch tries hard to comply with both domestic law and international law. So uh, I credit the administration. That's different from either the Obama administration, the Bush administration, or the Trump administration. So it's not like this is just going back to the Obama administration's statements about international law. They're actually including something in War Powers Report. But what's really significant here, and Ben, to your point, this just shows how far things have moved in 20 years, is the statement that, and I'm going to read it from the War Powers Report, is the United States always stands ready to take necessary and proportionate action in self-defense, including when, as is the case here, the government of the state where the threat is located is unwilling or unable to prevent the use of its territory by non-state militia groups responsible for such attacks. Now, I started in the White House in February 2001. You know, we all recall, or most of us recall, uh, how much sturm and drang there was about the preemption doctrine that was announced a year later in the Bush administration's national security strategy. But here we have in President Biden's inaugural war powers report, essentially a little mini national security strategy that if the Bush administration had said this 20 years ago, the world's heads would have exploded. Here we have the president within six weeks saying the United States is always ready to attack other countries if you're unwilling or unable to do something about it. Now, that's actually a, a, a statement that of, of international law that the United States has long believed in. I used to say it in my speeches at the time, and it goes back and has a, a long history all the way back to the Caroline case. But it's never been said in a war powers report before and is a pretty significant statement. And, and certainly the first time that the unwilling or unable test has been included uh, in a war powers report. I'll just end with this. You know, sometimes personalities can be important. And a uh, friend of lawfare and often lawfare contributor, Ashley Deeks, who is uh, one of the leading experts on the unwilling and unable test, has written the seminal article on it is now the deputy NSC legal advisor. But uh, I do think this statement in the War Powers Report is both new and significant and shows uh, uh, real continuity over four administrations. All right. So one area where there is less continuity, I think, is on the domestic law side, where you know the Obama administration really made a point of trying to situate everything it did in the context of the 2001 AUMF, the Trump administration, not because it was more aggressive exactly, but because it was operating in theaters in which it was much harder to apply the 2001 AUMF, fell back on the 2002 Iraq AUMF. Scott, how do you understand the current domestic law posture uh, of the Biden administration? That's a, a great question and gets at what I think is probably the one really notable takeaway from this 48 hours report that does shed light on a potential departure, or at least a question that the Biden administration hasn't settled yet about its approach to the AUMFs. And in part, it relates to an innovation that the Trump administration pursued and another one that the very late Obama administration pursued. Essentially, we saw uh, the Obama administration potentially, although it was never entirely done explicitly as far as where at the very end of the Obama administration, and then picked up by the Trump administration, embrace a theory of how the AUMF can be interpreted that extended the authorization provided by those statutes to not only addressing the entities that are directly fall under their scope. So, you know, perpetrators of 9-11 attracts, those who are safe and harbor them under 2001, 2002, you know, threats emanating from Iraq, but to third party entities that threaten either U.S. forces pursuing those missions or, and this was the Trump administration's most notable innovation, third party allies of ours uh, that were being threatened or attacked by third parties while they were participating with us by a mission authorized by the AUMF. We saw the first P-51 
peak of this really in Somalia in 2016, towards the end of the Obama administration, there was a military engagement with some elements of al-Shabaab that at the time, not all of al-Shabaab was seen as falling under the 2001 AUMF, although eventually they were all kind of pulled under that. And there was a theory at the time, although I don't think it was ever confirmed by the administration that, well, they may be relying upon the statutory idea that the 2001 AUMF authorizes U.S. forces to defend themselves against attacks from third parties um, because there was no 48 hours war powers report, which if they were relying on Article 2 authority, they would have been obligated to file, but they did not. So that hints that there may be a statutory authorization there. The Trump administration then extended a, this theory again to third party allies on the ground. And this is most important in Syria. In 2017 uh, and into 2018, we saw U.S. forces engage with uh, the Assad regime directly in the case of several fighter jets that shot down, and then notably Iran-backed militia groups uh, and notoriously uh, Wagner Group Russian mercenaries, essentially private security contractors working for the Assad regime and other actors in the region associated with the Assad regime in a direct hostile conflict because those forces, at first it was said, uh, were threatening locations where U.S. forces were co-located with Syrian democratic forces, our allies on the ground, a kind of a non-state armed group on the ground we worked with in the counter-ISIS offensive, and then later for directly threatening the SDF. And this all really became explicit in uh, the aforementioned legal and policies framework report that, that you and I sued over last year that came out in October, where the Trump administration finally kind of laid out the full scope of this theory, saying in a footnote, we interpret the 2001 and 2002 AUMS to extend to this third party ideas of individual self-defense and collective self-defense. I think this is is a is an interesting, innovative theory. Uh, I don't want. I think it's one that's also a little problematic. I think there's kind of a transparency question to say, well, look, you know, these are a case of self defense against a third party, and by not relying on Article Two, which I think a lot of people think could extend to at least individual self defense, you're essentially you know, hiding the fact that it's happening from Congress, or at least not reporting it. There's reason to think that may have contributed to some of the lack of knowledge on Congress's part about conflict happening in Niger and other parts of Africa uh, leading up to, um, you know, the eventual 2018 incident in which several U.S. Special Operations Forces service members were killed uh, in, inc- in an incident. That didn't come out for several months, in part because it was not re- reported under 48 hours reports. And, and so I think there's this question about saying, well, then the Biden administration and not relying upon this. And it's, it's worth noting these theories were relied upon by the Trump administration, both for the Soleimani strike and for other strikes against uh, Iran-backed militias, both in Iraq and Syria uh, prior and subsequent to that. Are, is the Biden administration saying they're moving away from this theory or are they simply not choosing to rely on it? Is it under review and, and they're determining their position on it? I strongly suspect the latter. Uh, if they were actually kind of moving away from the theory, disowning it, A, that's not a move that the you know legal bureaucracy in the executive branch usually tends to do. You know, you rarely see them kind of narrowing their band of options in the future, although you could see it in certain circumstances. But aside from the fact that the momentum doesn't usually tend to go that way, it's it's also if they were to do that, in theory, they should be providing Congress with a 30-day notice of a change to the legal and policy frameworks report, which we haven't seen a sign of them providing to Congress yet. Maybe it's happened, they just didn't report it publicly, something along those lines, but there's no sign of that yet. But nonetheless, it at least shows that there is some reconsideration and skepticism potentially of relying upon these theories of the AUMFs in pursuing the strike. And that's in addition to the other justification that they did rely upon for the Soleimani strike, which is that it was directly authorized by the 2002 AUMF, as you noted, because Soleimani was undermining democracy in Iraq, and that's what the 2002 AUMF does. Similarly, the Biden administration doesn't seem willing to embrace that theory. That was an interpretation of the 2002 AUMF that was expressly kind of articulated by the Obama administration, but never really used in a meaningful way, but that the Trump administration kind of picked up and ran with in the Soleimani strikes. And again, there's this resistance to embracing both of those views of the 2002 and 2001 AUMFs. Yeah. So I think that we need to be really aware of these legal authorities as potential slippery slope. So just to add to Scott's point, there are two different legal theories that are related that are going on here. One is unit self-defense, this concept that when we deploy troops abroad, we can protect them against attacks on them or or even hostile threats. And this is in the US standing rules of engagement. So this is not um, some sort of obscure legal theory that they haven't put forward. Um, and the other is this idea of, of collective self-defense, not collective self-defense of another nation where we have, but rather at the sort of micro level also, collective self-defense of partner forces. So when our partner forces, not even our troops, but our partner forces come under attack that we can act to defend them. And so this gives, this is a real sort of 
slippery slope uh, that we that we need to be aware of that when we send troops abroad that means under the united states view that we're giving those troops the right to respond to to use force to respond with threats and they're going to face threats so we might even go in there with the consent of the state in a particular circumstance and that at at that moment in time might make the situation easier to accept in particular for lawmakers but once we're there we're then able to to bootstrap on this additional justification. We're able to legally justify the use of force in that state, or it turns out in the case of these serious strikes, right, elsewhere without consent. And, and we've now extend, and we've extended this justification to defense and partner forces as well. And that particular extension, I think, has raised some concerns in Congress. Um, Senator Kane has raised these concerns, and there's even a particular reporting requirement in the last NDA to address that piece of it, but not, but doesn't actually address the unit self defense component. So, John, one of the weird things about this strike was the circumstances of congressional notification, which. Uh, involved a smaller number of people than one might expect and a much shorter window of time before the strike took place, I think, you know, 15 minutes or so. Do you have a read on why the Biden administration is starting off with a very limited uh, sense of pre-strike briefing to members of Congress? I don't. I, you know, one would certainly assume that uh, the Biden administration, with uh, with with uh, President Biden coming out of the Senate himself, would be you know, very much in favor of briefing Congress and keeping them informed in advance as much as possible. I would assume. Uh, so I would assume here that either that the Defense Department acted very quickly for reasons that we may not know that some intelligence information that they wanted to act quickly. That's not entirely clear why, because the the building that they struck was not actually moving, or uh, that it was essentially just a screw up, uh, that uh, the notices were not done as broadly and as quickly as should have been. So, you know, it's it's always a good idea to try to clear things in advance as much as possible. The executive branch, of course, does worry about leaks, uh, so that not too much warning is given. But, you know, it's hard to tell whether this was intentional or just a screw up. Scott, Beck, do either of you have a sense of of whether this was intentional or just a screw up? Yeah, I, I've been looking at some of the reporting around this and, and asking around a little bit around town. Um, it, what's interesting is that if you look at who acknowledged getting some advance notice, uh, although it appears to have been relatively brief, like a few minutes. It's actually uh, Senator Warner, who, of course, you know, chairs the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee, you know, was one of the people who said he got advance notice. And it looks like, in fact, the notice may have been given to potentially to the Gang of Eight that usually gets advance notice of intelligence operations. That isn't entirely unprecedented in this circumstance because there is a strange jurisdictional breakdown around all sorts of military and quasi-military intelligence activities where, you know, sensitive military operations, which is one category supposed to be alerted to the Armed Services Committee, intelligence operations, the Intelligence Committee, yet it's the Foreign Relations Committees that actually have jurisdiction over the war powers questions, war powers resolution. That is usually the conventional channel for something like this, that seems like a more conventional sort of military action. Um, the truth is, these aren't really new problems. Like there often have been these sorts of frictions of notification, and it's not weird for it to happen kind of the first at bat of an administration that's still getting its footing, still figuring out internal procedures and relations with the Hill. But, you know, I think it does point actually kind of like a bigger problem that Congress could be a little more proactive addressing, which is that you've got this weird, uh, you know, bifurcated, trifurcated uh, jurisdictional arrangement among the relative committees that are dealing with parts of this that leads to these gaps in information sometimes on notice. It's worth noting uh, Secretary Blinken is actually on the Hill uh, and has been in a skiff briefing the Senate Foreign Relations Committee today for several hours. I think they got out recently in part on this issue. And I think that's a, a sign from the administration saying, oops, you know, he, let us give you a full breakdown so we're on the same page and, and adjusting for it. So I think it is some of that growing pains that, that John alluded to in this case, but it's reflective of, of a, system, a, a broader systematic problem that, that it may be worth Congress thinking about a little bit, uh, better ways to approach. Beck, what is your sense of the congressional friction? So I am watching this and thinking that the Biden administration may have underestimated its honeymoon period with Congress. So Congress has been rallying, even in bipartisan efforts around war powers reform, 
certainly was under the last administration. And I think these strikes are, are seem to be giving them sort of new impetus to raise these issues again under this one. And it's long been my view that the only way to get this done and, uh, is to do it when the president is being constrained by, so to speak, his own people in Congress. So in this case, a Democratic Congress constraining a Democratic president could be could be the perfect storm for actually passing more powers reform. I mean, I, without getting into the nitty gritty of what war powers reform would look like, why do you think, I mean, given that Tim Kaine has been beating this particular drum for a long time, uh, and the president's people are not babes in the woods on this subject, uh, why do you think they might have miscalculated the degree to which, I mean, you know, the, he would come in, do a a strike relatively quickly with very limited congressional notification, that seems like a kind of thumb in Tim Kaine's eye to me. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And in this case, look, if if this had looked to all, like it would clearly, you know, look, necessary is a legal term of art and people have different views about what it means. But I don't think anyone is looking at this and thinking, oh, yeah, it was so clearly necessary for the U.S. government in a colloquial sense for the U.S. government to act in self-defense in this immediate way with no time to truly consult with Congress and certainly no time to get congressional authorization. Of, you know, days and days later, after we were, we were struck in Iraq, that we're going to hit a facility in Syria that we can't even say in our statement to Congress or in our statement to the Security Council was itself a base for launching attacks. That just doesn't feel to people, I think. That's my, you know, on the outside, like it was truly necessary to act with the kind of imminence that would not permit consultation with Congress. John, do you do you agree with that? Yeah, I was actually just going to say, I, you know, I'm not sure I do. And that I, I was actually really rather surprised about the pushback that the administration got from Congress on this. I mean, you know, we all know the concern amongst progressives on war powers and use of force. And I've been very supportive of, of AUMF reform and what Tim Kaine has said. And we'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, this was not like a bolt out of the blue. If the Biden administration had done this just out of the blue, I I would you know, think that these uh, concerns expressed would be legitimate. But, you know, the the administration was was responding to an attack that killed some people and injured a U.S. soldier in the region. Uh, so, you know, they were responding. Again, we don't know all of the intelligence as to whether they felt this would deter further attacks. But I assume that that is the case, is that they didn't want to just take this attack uh, and do nothing that they wanted to respond. So uh, again, and I, and, and I, I think that links up to you know, the point I made about what they included in the War Powers Report, which is uh, which I assume they thought hard about because it's new and was said for the first time to say that the administration is always prepared to use force to defend Americans. That's a really strong statement. But you know, the main point is you know they were responding here, and I'm a bit surprised that Congress jumped on them over it. Yeah, I'll just jump in briefly to say that there's two different things going on here. One is the substantive standard of when it's okay to use force. And the other, and that's really the international law question. And the other is a procedural question about who gets to make that decision as a policy matter. And that's the domestic law separation of powers question. And so, John, you may be right that this was a, even putting aside the law, that this was as a policy matter, a legitimate and important thing to do. And whether or not it was, doesn't answer the question of whether or not Congress should have been involved in the decision making. And so I think, and that's the domestic law piece of this. And so that's the piece that I think, I, you know, it is quite possible. Senator Kane may be a hawk when it comes down to it, but he wants a role for his institution, which is a constitutionally mandated role. All right. I want to propose a different theory of the case of what happened here, which is that the administration responding, as John said, to a attack is also quite sensitive in the context of the current politics where Mike Pompeo comes out of office and 
basically immediately accuses them of being sort of weak on Iran and, you know, is keen to kind of show that they are, you know, not pushovers, even though they want to talk to the Iranians about the nuclear program and also to send a message to members of Congress that they're not going to get infinitely bogged down in situations like the Obama administration did where you go to Congress for permission to act in Syria only to find that Congress, having demanded that you come, doesn't give you the authorization. And so it was convenient, Scott, for the administration to simultaneously show that Congress's role is, whatever it may be, limited, and that unlike the uh, Obama administration, the Biden administration is not going to get caught up in a congressional bait and switch. And by the way, it's also not going to get too easily outflanked on Iran. So to what extent are those completely non-legal policy and political considerations parts of this picture? I think it's plausible they've entered in. Uh, you know, the one thing I'll note is, uh, I agree. I think that probably factors into any question about authorization. I still think there's this advanced consultation question, and it does look like there was some effort to give some advance notice to some people on the Hill. Just happened, did not happen to be the right people. So that seems to nod towards there having been some sort of just confusion or uh, you know growing pains as as the administration's figuring out the right procedures, having not done this before. And there's no right answer for these things. It's just past practice and rules in place, and they just may not quite have gotten there yet. But uh, certainly on the authorization question, I, I think it's fair. I, I think it's probably equally likely, and if not a little bit more likely, though, that as Beck kind of alluded, and John kind of alluded, you know, Congress is just more sensitive to these things. They're more teed in on these things than they were four years ago or eight years ago. We've seen majorities in Congress vote to limit President Trump's um, you know, military activities in regard to Iran and Yemen, that those votes didn't amount to anything. They were vetoed and 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 had questionable, you know, actual legal effects if they'd actually gone into effect regardless. But People are mobilized a little bit more around this, and and so I don't think we I don't think we can just attribute it to the Biden administration trying to muscle around. I will say, and and you know, we did a podcast on this a couple of weeks ago, right after the strikes, focusing on the Iraq and kind of the policy questions. I really hope <laughs> that the main reason uh, the administration didn't do this was just to answer domestic critics. Um, there are always going to be domestic critics that are always pushing for use of force in response to any sort of threat or use of force. That's rarely a good reason to do it, at least in my view. Uh, it is always a bad reason to do it in Iraq, where U.S. Mil uses of military force, or in relation to Iraq, I should say, U.S. use of military force can have really, really damaging domestic consequences for the long-term political sustainability of the important U.S. military and diplomatic mission that's happening there. So, you know, I... I don't have any doubt domestic political factors entered into this. They always do in any decision like this. Uh, but I sincerely hope that wasn't just the driver, or at least the sole driver in this sort of case, because that is going to be a recipe for uh, a less than optimal outcome in Iraq, to say the least. Um, instead, I hope there were some of the strategic factors we talked about, about um, you know, deterring future attacks and uh, making a response to this that, that also entered into the equation. All right. So let's turn to the various reports that Congress uh, or that the administration has released. There is, as a preliminary matter, the Legal and Policy Frameworks Report, uh, which has been given to Congress, but if I'm Scott, has still not been made public, right? That is correct. As of as of uh, a week past the of it being transferred to Congress, we still have not seen a public version as of yet, uh, which is what's required by the statute. And then there is the Interim National Security Strategy, which was released John, get us started on this. Uh, obviously, one of them, we don't know what it says, um, although I don't expect it will be all that different from the last one, but it may be a little bit different. With either of these documents, is the Biden administration likely to significantly move the ball? Or is this, uh, again, sort of the area where, despite the rhetoric of campaigns and you know, the different national security talking points of the various parties. This is the sort of area where the permanent interests of the United States tend to keep things on a relatively static course. So again, I think we're going to see more continuity here. 
with maybe just a slightly different tone. Let me take the legal policy framework first, because we don't know what it's going to say, so there's less to say about it. Uh, They're going to be, of course, commenting on what happened during the Trump administration. And so it's probably easier for them to be critical of what the Trump administration did. But to the extent they also set forth their own legal and policy framework going forward, I don't think we're going to see a lot of change you know, from the Obama administration or for uh, you know, the general U.S. policy on, on use of force. That would really quite surprise me. And I, I can't quite understand why they haven't released it publicly yet. I think Scott in a minute has said that he may have heard something. But let's talk about the national security strategy, which, one, I applaud them for getting it out so quickly. They they must have been working on this uh you know, during the last year and during the transition, it usually takes a administration quite a while to put a national security strategy together. So this is an impressive piece of work, really, all across the board. Uh, and I, its emphasis on uh, multilateralism, on U.S. leadership, on working with uh, international institutions and international rules. You know, I, I really thought it was quite good on use of force. Depending how you look at the glasses, whether half full or half empty, you know, it does say that force will be used uh, as a last resort and that the U.S. will use diplomacy first. So, you know, a critic could say, well, gee, that's really new here, that that we're really de-elevating U.S. willingness to use force. Uh, And this is more of a democratic sort of peaceful view, you know. I don't think, though, that's really true. It's maybe a slight uh, 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 difference in tone, but let me say two things. One, I think that also has to be read against this extremely significant sentence in President Biden's War Powers Report that says that the United States is always prepared to use force to defend Americans if other countries are unwilling or unable to do so. That's a really robust statement about use of force. Two, actually, if you compare the words in the Biden national security strategy about use of force with the lecture that my boss at the time, Condoleezza Rice, gave uh, the Riston lecture at the Manhattan Institute, where she sort of decompacted the Bush administration's preemption doctrine, which had been announced in its uh, national security strategy, in which the Bush administration got a lot of flack, sort of suggesting that it was going to be rampaging around the world using force. And then she she then uh, explained that in more detail to say, look, this is really nothing new. Anticipatory self-defense has been around for a long time. It's accepted under international law and that countries shouldn't act first without exhausting other means, including diplomacy, and that preemptive action does not come at the beginning of a long chain of effort. So, you know, they're really saying the same thing here almost 20 years apart in saying uh, that the U.S. is prepared to use force to protect Americans, including if other countries are unwilling or unable to do so, but that that ought to come at the end of a, a long line of other actions with diplomacy first. So, you know, bottom line, Ben, I don't I don't see a huge difference here. Uh, and I'd be really surprised if something in the legal and policy framework suddenly tips the balance. Yeah. So Beck is if I were a campus left student and I heard John say that, I would say, see, it doesn't matter what political party you vote for you're still getting the same old forever war mentality, whether it's Democrats or Republicans. And Bellinger has just, you know, pulled the wool away from everyone's eyes. Uh, There's no difference between the Bush administration, on, on this stuff anyway, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration. They're all reserving the right of preemptive war and nodding to one degree or another to the idea that you try to do other things first. Would that lefty, uh, I can't decide if this is an anti-globalization protester or a lefty college student, would that person have a point? So I agree with John that in looking at this national security strategy, we see a lot of rhetoric that we've seen before. I mean, most presidents, with the exception, I guess, of the last one, 
tend to say, of course, that the use of force is going to be a last resort. Most of them don't tend to sort of glorify the use of force for its own sake. Um, and we'll just put the last administration, at least the, the head of it, to the side, I guess, on that. But the, the real question then is, well, what do they actually do and what are their what are their legal arguments for doing so? And so on this one, I want to just disagree a little bit with John about this idea that anticipatory self-defense has remained a constant legal view across administrations. I mean, I think that there has been more and less aggressive views on when a state can respond, when the United States can respond to an imminent threat and what that imminent, what imminence actually has to mean in that scenario. So the Bush administration did put forward a pretty aggressive view of what would constitute an imminent threat. And it need not be something that we think of in the colloquial sense of imminence, right? It need not be something that they necessarily knew was going to happen or when it was going to happen, but rather that the other side was developing capabilities and could eventually strike in a way that would be harmful to the United States. So that that was at least one of the legal arguments put forward in all C memos um, in the lead up to the Iraq war. And I think the Obama administration really tried to dial that back. They didn't give up the idea of the ability to strike in response to an imminent threat, but the idea was that imminence had to have some closer connection to a set of factors such as past actions and a more specific future threat. But they didn't say that it had to be an identifiable future threat. So they so they still left open some ambiguity in what imminence means. I think unwilling unable, and I and I would and I and I love that John pointed out that sentence because I think that's a really important sentence also in the in the letter to Congress in the reporting requirement. I think unwilling unable is a different question. So un- unwilling unable is when can we strike in a state that has not itself struck us, right? Now, we might be striking in response to an imminent attack, but we might be striking in response to an actual attack, right? Al-Qaeda, that was a, uh, the 9-11 attacks were an actual attack to which we were responding. And the goal was to presumably repel future attacks as well. But we were responding there to an actual attack. But we took force, we used force in Afghanistan, a state that it did not itself arguably strike us. So in this case, though, in this statement here, the government saying that we can use force, the United States can use force when the government of the state where the threat is located is unwilling or unable to prevent the use of its territory by non-state militia groups responsible for such attacks. That doesn't say prevent the use of its territory for attacks against the United States. So there's some really interesting work being done there. And I'd like to know more about what the government is claiming in that context, right? Is it claiming only the limited right? And so the limited view of unwilling and unable would be that we can use force in Syria if there is a an imminent threat emanating from Syria. A much more expansive view would be, hey, we're in an armed conflict with this group, or we have been threatened by this group. They also happen to be using facilities in Syria. Can we use force against those facilities in Syria? That's a really expansive view of unwilling and able. And I'd like to know what's the view that the government's currently operating under. All right. Before we run out of time, Scott, let's talk about a little bit about what you expect from the legal and policy frameworks report, which, as John says, we don't really know what's in it, but I think we have a reasonable idea of what's likely to be in it. What's your what's your sense of it? Sure. Well, we know the Trump administration, uh, as I think John alluded to already, interpreted this report as covering the prior calendar year, not the year leading up to the March 1st due date. Uh, and that means that if the Biden administration sticks to that interpretation, and it might, it's not an unreasonable way to read the statute necessarily, that it's just going to be commenting on Trump administration actions. And the one thing that I would expect to see, we might get some clarity from, is the one real innovation that's happened, at least in my mind, since the Obama Obama administration's legal and policy framework report, and that is the individual slash collective self-defense interpretations under the 2001 and 2002 AMS that I talked about previously. It is something a little new. Again, the fact that Biden administration didn't rely on that or really point to that in the 40 hours report suggests to me that it's probably under some sort of review or reconsideration, uh, at least before they wholeheartedly re-embrace it, or or, that, or maybe they've already decided that they're going to reject it. And that might be reflected in this sort of report. Aside from that, you know, I think it'll be, it primarily serves 
source to provide a commentary on potentially a criticism of some of the Trump administration's actions. There are still a lot of questions around the Soleimani strike and the exact domestic and international law justifications there. The one explanation we got from the Trump administration was not very detailed. Folks on the Hill of both parties were actually quite critical of the briefing they received, saying it left a lot of questions open. Uh, and I'm not aware of there having been a subsequent one that addressed them. So, you know, there are these sorts of points that are certainly relevant from a historical perspective, from a uh, you know past U.S. practice perspective that are worth clarifying that that hopefully will be in this report. In terms of why we don't have it yet, there's not a great answer. It's pretty clearly required to be disclosed publicly. Um, you know, the statute says the report has to be an unclassified portion, and that the unclassified portion has to be provided to the public. There's a classified annex. No one disagrees with that. Um, you know, they could assert executive privilege, I guess, for stuff they didn't want to disclose to Congress. But neither of those appears to happen. The administration's confirmed that they've given a report with an unclassified portion to Congress, and that unclassified portion is supposed to be given to the public. I suspect it's still going to happen. I think this is another example of just a growing pain. Uh, and these uh, the fact that as much as it is, you know, to us from the outside, it seems like a very easy thing to do. I think folks who've worked in the executive branch, as John and Beck obviously have, uh, you know, will say, and I think it's even more true of the White House, the rest of the executive branch, even doing things like updating <laughs> a website requires a lot of sign off on a lot of clearance. And particularly when it's not a high priority item and you're having to get sign off from people with lots of other items to deal with, it might just take time. That's a very generous interpretation. And and my uh, my inclination to be generous is, is waning as the days tick off between the deadline when the report was supposed to be provided and it hasn't been, but I'm still optimistic we'll get it uh, in the near term. John, there was a report the other day in the New York Times uh, from Charlie Savage that the Biden administration had at least temporarily put something in place like the old Obama era PPG. And simultaneously, uh, there is, you know, once again, renewed talk of AUMF reform. Uh, these two issues are not directly related in the sense that one is the, you know, question of how much restraint the administration and the White House particularly is going to exercise over the executive branch with respect to individual drone strikes, whereas the other question is really a question of of what Congress is going to authorize, but it is, uh, they are related in the sense that they reflect a certain, a certain level of discomfort with the relevance of the current uh, statutory and legal framework and kind of a, a question about what additional guidance should be necessary or may be necessary. And so my question is just the question of what is the prospect for, in your view, uh, reform of the the overall framework in the coming years is this the finally the time that we're going to see AUMF reform or or uh, or are we going to be tinkering around the edges with you know documents like the PPG and and the Trump administration's subsequent rollback of that? Well, let me take the PPG first quickly and then move to the the more interesting issue on the AUMF. So. On the PPG, again, I, I started you know, right at the beginning of the Bush administration. And of course, the first thing we did and that I did as NSC legal advisor was to look at all the authorities that we had, including military authorities, intelligence authorities, covert action authorities that we'd inherited from the Clinton administration and decide, you know, did we like them? Did we want to keep them? Did we want to change them? And, you know, that's what the Biden administration is doing now is they're looking at all of the things that they've inherited. Uh, so the Charlie Savage report suggests that they've maybe, you know, put some limits on the loosening of restrictions on drone strikes that the Trump administration may have allowed. But that's, you know, may just be a temporary pause pending this review. You know, I think where we might all guess is that, you know, maybe the Obama administration had been a little bit too restrictive. You know, Charlie wrote a whole book about uh, how the Obama administration becomes sort of governed by lawyers. You know, maybe the Trump administration was too loose and gone too far the other way. So we may end up with sort of the Goldilocks option of, of this one fits just right. And, you know, I do think that there's become drone fatigue. And so, you know, I think they're, they may be somewhat more restrictive on drone strikes, but, you know, not too. On AUMF reform, the interesting thing was that Jen Psaki said, 
that President Biden uh, supports replacing the existing War Powers Authority. She didn't specify which ones, but uh, with a narrow and specific framework. So, you know, presumably, if you match that up with what Tim Kaine uh, and others, both Democrats and Republicans, said they want to do, which was to repeal the 2002 and 1991 Iraq AUMFs, you know, maybe there's some support for that amongst both Democrats and Republicans. I mean, you know, do we really need the 1991 and 2002 AUMFs? I I'll be, you know, I think there may be still a few lawyers at, at possibly DOD or DOJ that say, well, there are wisps of, of value left in the 2002 AUMF, but, you know, maybe we can get coalesce lessons around repealing all of those. Repealing and then replacing the 2001 AUMF, as we all know, is a lot harder. I mean, it ought to be easier in that, you know, Almost everybody agrees that it ought to be revised, but trying to get that sweet spot of where everybody can agree uh, on what it ought to say uh, is just a whole lot harder. So I guess bottom line, Ben, I'd be a bit surprised if we can't repeal these uh, a couple of these AUMFs. But you know, we just all know that even though you know good government dictates, and I have long supported this that the 2001 AUMF ought to be revised. I guess I'm not uh, uh, going to run to the bank on it right now. Beck, what do you think? Is uh, is this the year for AUMF reform? Yeah, I'm, I'm with John in that it might be that the 2002 and the 91 AUMFs are sort of the low-hanging fruit here. The 2001 AUMF is not go- only going to be really hard as a matter of substance in terms of how to revise it, but it's also really risky. And so we're going to have to sort of be vigilant to the ways in which all of the different legal mechanisms and interpretations that the, that executive, the executive branch through multiple presidential administrations has now used to expand their interpretation of the 2001 AUMF will continue to apply to future AUMFs unless they are really carefully worded in ways that preclude that interpretation. And so that's going to be, you know, what's what the danger here is that we end up with a more open-ended authority, even if that's not the intention to the president. The danger in repealing the 2002 AUMF is that it, that doesn't uh, resolve the question of the president's consultation with Congress over the serious strikes here, right? Because the, the more congressional authorizations we repeal, the more that puts pressure on the president to rely on sole constitutional authority. And so I think that this all has to be done in conjunction with general war powers reform. Scott, you get the last word on this before I pronounce the actual future. Uh, What do you think? Are we going to see any combination of AUMF reform or war powers reform over the next couple of years? I will agree with John and Beck. I, I think that the lowest hanging fruit is obviously the 1991 and 2002 AUMS relating to Iraq. We've seen bipartisan bills with pretty substantial bipartisan support already introduced to that effect, both in the last Congress and now this Congress with more bipartisan support. They're not relied upon. It will have zero impact on operations except to cabin things like the Soleimani strike that have proven quite controversial in a lot of circles. So I, I think those are likely to go. I frankly would put money on that happening this year. Uh, that's a little bit of an ambitious bet, but I think it's a real possibility because people, a lot of people want to show some sort of progress on some aspect of this front, and this is just the easiest one to move it on. 2001 AUMF is going to be a lot harder. Part of the reason, I think, is because people keep looking for the right solution and the perfectly tailored AUMF. And there's just a lot of disagreement about that, about what the right scope of U.S. counterterrorism operations is. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, we should be relying upon Article 2 more. Um, but other people, and I would put myself in this latter camp, are much more concerned about creating an incentive structure to push the executive branch towards broader assertions of Article 2 authority, because, of course, those are potentially harder for Congress to rein in caveat limit and otherwise be a co-equal or at least a co-actor in setting the, the policy in that area. What I do think is a real possibility is is that a piecemeal approach to 2001 AUMF. Everybody recognizes it has certain fundamental problems. And I think you might get consensus around certain ways to cabin those fundamental problems. So maybe Congress gets together and says, we're going to cap the geographic scope of the 2001 AUMF. Whatever the executive branch has reported, they're using it, those locations, that's it. 
And if you want to go beyond that to new geographic areas, you've got to come back to Congress. They could do the same thing with which would be the most influential reform by setting a sunset. Even if it is two, three, four, five years down the road, you're really setting a deadline that says, Congress is this authority is going to have to go away. We're going to have to have a new conversation about it. I think those are all possibilities. And I, I think that um, you might see more of that sort of hedging and cabining of the 2001 AMF as opposed to the adoption of an entirely new framework for these authorizations moving forward. As Beck noted, though, you know, these are just part of the problem. The AUMF, the current authorizations, is just one part of the broader war powers discussion. There's also discussion about how Congress engages with Article II uses of authority. That's the war powers resolution, the limits and reporting obligations and things that Congress needs to put on that, which is the regime does not operate now as it was envisioned in 1973. And certainly there's lots of space for reform there, including pretty low hanging fruit like transparency and reporting obligation reforms that I think you could see happen. But there's a bigger question about saying, does Congress need to set some rules or set up incentives for itself that when it adopts future AUMFs, that that it does so in a more responsible fashion than the 2001 AUMF, arguably, that sets in geographic limits, temporal limits, uh, so Congress doesn't accidentally write itself out of the war-making equation, as many people feel it did with the 2001 AUMF. I think there are actually interesting ways to do that. It's a question that doesn't get a lot of attention, but I think it's hopefully, if there is a real appetite for taking it on, that is one area where you could actually really see Congress, this Congress in particular, has set some frameworks in place that could have long-term ramifications, but it's also the most ambitious undertaking and who knows if the bandwidth is there to do it. All right. Here is the actual reality as I foresee it. Uh, you are all correct that the 2001 AUMF will face uh, no amendment or repeal, but you're all completely wrong that the 2002 AUMF is toast because in fact, Congress will not have the gumption to repeal any AUMF. And I cite as my authority for this the Dwight Eisenhower era Taiwan AUMF, which is still in effect to this very day. And I think the path of least resistance for Congress is always not to do anything. And the lift in question to get over the hump of inaction is extremely high. And as a result, it always looks more promising at the beginning of the year than at the end of the year that anything happens, especially when the cost of nothing happening is, as is the case with A's UMF, that Congress gets to complain about executive action, but isn't really responsible for it. Uh, whereas if it takes action and does something, it could be held responsible for the action. So color me a skeptic that any uh, any AUMF will will see the end of days this year. All right. So quickly to wrap, what is a big salient war powers issue that you're going to have your eye on over the next few months? John, what, what is your eye on these days? Well, the one thing that we haven't talked about, uh, an old chestnut that I've been long involved in and written a lot about is Guantanamo closure. And of course, that does relate to war powers and to the 2001 AUMF, because that is the, the, the holding of the people in Guantanamo is based on the 2001 AUMF. But aside from that is, you know, can the administration even close it? Uh, the Biden administration has said that they would like to do so and are going to work to do it. But this gets back again to Congress uh, because we continue to have the prohibitions on transfers to the United States. So to actually close Guantanamo, you know, not all of these people are going to be able to be let go elsewhere. You know, there are a number that just aren't. And so, you know, I, I, in my mind, the only way to close it is to get Congress to uh, lift these uh, restrictions. And we'll have to see if the Biden administration could do that. Scott, what do you have your eye on? Well, I, I agree Guantanamo is a big outstanding question, but in a way, I think the most immediate one this administration is going to have to deal with is actually the U.S. military presence and activities in Syria. Uh, the Obama administration, when it left office, was engaged in a counter-ISIS mission there very expressly uh, with a military presence and a supporting local actors engaged in that mission. That mission uh, has been 
while there's still aspects of it that are still ongoing in terms of actual ISIS presence on the ground, it's certainly much smaller scale than it used to be. The Trump administration, meanwhile, dramatically changed our presence in Syria. You know, where we have forces there are primarily located around uh, helping to preserve oil wells in Deir Ezzor and around Atamf, a kind of uh, border uh, observation station that is is kind of removed from the hubs of ISIS activity that we worry about and has actually has been for several years now. So uh, if you're going to go back to this counter ISIS justification, it's really, really hard to square uh, as a legal basis for the actual activity the United States is addressing in Iraq. I think the Biden administration's already hinted they do see it as a counter ISIS mission, and maybe they're going to adjust the activities in Syria to uh, better align with that objective and what makes sense or otherwise draw uh, the lines of explanation about why what they're doing there now directly relates to the counter ISIS mission, uh, as opposed to a counter Iran mission or a counter Assad mission that the Trump administration hinted at many times separate from the counter ISIS 2001 AOMF mission. But I don't know yet. It's really, really hard questions on a variety of fronts legally and policy wise there. And it's one that the Biden administration is not going to be able to escape for long. So I think that's that's a big set of questions they're going to have to deal with. Beck, you get the last word. What are you thinking about? So I agree with John that Guantanamo is a sort of remains a huge issue. It is sadly an issue that the American public appears to have moved on from. I think the the most significant obstacles to closing Guantanamo are really political ones. There have been countless proposals floated for the nitty gritty of how to do it, but ultimately the Obama administration chose not to expend the political capital necessary to get it done at repeated turning points. And now, as, as John mentions, there are congressional restrictions, and so it will require some statutory fixes in order to make it happen. John didn't say this, but I'm guessing that his proposal would include some version of moving Guantanamo into the United States, which I would adamantly oppose. So my view of closing Guantanamo is really a, a charger release view. It, it would not include what some had floated during the Obama years of what I view as sort of bringing Guantanamo to uh, stateside, you know, to CONUS. Because uh, that is just taking a, a, a problem that someone else created, turning it into your own legacy, and then owning indefinite detention on U.S. soil forever. Um, and there's also the problem of once you open that possibility for that authority, um, you're opening it up for future for future presidents to use as well. So that's a huge obstacle, the political obstacle to closing Guantanamo. But I don't see that as insurmountable. And I think it's the the biggest issue. And it's just going to require some political courage to say, listen, we're going to have to be willing to take some risks in order to close this. Because the the only alternative is that we end up with um, 10 or 20 years from now talking about Guantanamo as sort of a, a nursing home facility. And one day we'll be reading an article about the the last detainee to die at Guantanamo. And so in order to avoid that alternative, uh, it's going to it's gonna require political actors to make some hard decisions and accept some risks. But it's not like there are no risks to keeping it open. It's just harder to pin those on any one executive branch official. We're going to leave it there. Rebecca Ingber, Scott Anderson, John Bellinger, thank you all for joining us. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is Zachary Frank of Goat Rodeo. You need to do your part to promote the Lawfare Podcast, so tweet us, share us on Facebook, pin us on Pinterest, upvote us on Reddit and leave a rating or review wherever you found it. Our merch is available at the Lawfare Store. The Lawfare Podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.